We've got to have ambulances and police out here right away. What's There's, going on? There is a girl hanging by her broken leg from the telephone wire. All right, stay on the phone with me. Hold on, sis. You got help coming. I got a FaceTime call from God. I was up there, and in my mind, I obviously didn't have my phone, and it's a picture of Christ putting his hand through the water. And that was his profile picture, and it was the accept and the decline button, and God was calling me. And I knew it was him calling me home, and I started hitting the accept button, and it wasn't accepting, and I start panicking because the phone only rings for so long. Right. And eventually it just stops ringing, and I can see my reflection in the screen, and it's just beat up like I'm bruised there's blood everywhere I looked rough and I just knew in that moment I had to stay so Kennedy Little Dyke welcome to the maybe God podcast we are so so glad to be able to talk to you I've hoped and uh, waited for this interview for several months now and it's really cool to have you here so thanks for being here yeah I'm excited thanks for giving me this opportunity of course so you're uh, an inspiration to many your story inspired me when I first came across it, and we'll get to everything that happened um, a little bit later. But before we get to all of that, um, I just kind of want to get to know you a little bit. And, and in particular, I want our listeners to get to know the person you were before the night that changed your life forever. Um, so take us back a little bit to where you grew up and, and what that was like. Um, so if I were to go way back, I was kind of born and raised in Melba, Idaho. It's about 30 minutes out from Boise, Idaho. And I lived there until 2017. I think we moved away when I was 12. And we moved to Ducklow, Idaho, which is a super, super small town. Um, How small? Don't know. Uh, population? My graduating class was 60 something. So. <laughs> put that in perspective so very small yeah um it's close to burley i don't know a lot of people just fill up gas there that's yeah. about it <laughs> um and i love to play soccer i was captain my junior year and my accident ended up happening happening the end of my junior year and um i guess this is part of my story too yeah i had struggles with mental health issues. I was struggled with depression and I wasn't happy with my life. Um, I just felt like life was hard, even though I had no idea how much harder it was gonna get. My dad had been diagnosed with cancer. Um, I also struggled with an eating disorder where I would work out for pr practice like excessively and then I would go all day off of Red Bulls and gum and then maybe one meal at, at the end of the day. So I had some mental health stuff going on. What do you attribute that to looking back? What do you mean? Like how did you end up in that struggle? Uh, I don't know necessarily. I would say the depression is from looking at so many different things on social media, which it's crazy because a lot of people are like, social media doesn't have an impact on your mental health. It 100% does, depending uh, on what you're looking at. Who says it doesn't? You need to stop listening to those people. I just assume people <laughs> that will be like, I'm not deleting social media. That's not what is wrong. Right. Like, that's not going to help me, which um, I don't believe. Like, if you're struggling mentally with body image or just thinking, have a weird perception of what life actually is because you see so many people living it completely differently. I highly suggest yeah. Get on social media. Yeah. So, I mean, is it overly simplistic to say you saw people on social media who looked ways you didn't see yourself looking in the mirror or you living lives you didn't see yourself living and you felt less than? Well, I was never fat. Like I've always been super skinny all my life and I felt felt like I needed to uphold that because people would comment about it all the time of like, oh, you're so skinny, you're so skinny. And when you get told that, you don't ever want to be like 
more than that. Right. Uh, like if you're not so, that, who are you? Yeah. So yeah. at my accident, I was, I'm pretty sure on the scale, I was like 110 pounds yeah. at 16 years old, which is not healthy. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's your junior year, which is a hard year for, for a lot of kids. Um, I mean, yeah, awful schools that year. Rough, it's hard. a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. You had some mental health things going on. Were you in a relationship at the time? Um, I was, and that's kind of what the accident goes along with because we'd broken up two days prior. It was like my first boyfriend. I was 16, obviously. You think all of crazy things. He's the love of your um, life. Because, yeah, something yeah. like that. <laughs> it's pretty typical. Everybody goes through that. Yeah. And we'd broken up two days prior of my accident, and that's kind of what, yeah. where the story gets rolling. Right, right. So um, would you say, how bad was the mental state leading up to that fateful day? Like, were you, I mean, I hate such a personal question. Were you suicidal? How bad, how dark was it? Um, I had what I want, like, I would say I knew what I wanted to do for if, like, I was going to commit suicide, but I wasn't necessarily ready to pull the trigger yet. But at the same time, I didn't really have a plan for my life. I mean, I had hopes, like, I wanted to play soccer, but I didn't really care to plan anything because I wasn't planning on it. Yeah. But I wasn't at that time... Like, oh, I'm ready to commit suicide. Yeah, right. Man, um, okay, so we get to the uh, latter part of your junior year, um, mm -hmm. into the spring. Um, May 22nd, I think, was the day that everything mm -hmm. changed of uh, 2021. Um, just kind of take us through what happened. So it was a Saturday. I only had a week left of school. So it was the weekend before the last week of school. And like I'd said previously, me and my boyfriend at the time had broken up. I was emotional and I'd went to work that day. And before I went to work, my mom had asked me if I would go to Logan, Utah with her um, to go help some family with yard work, my grandma that lives there. And I told her I had work and I couldn't get it off because it was such last minute. And she had a super strong feeling to make me go with her and I just told her no. And at this time, I did not have the best relationship with my parents, I was stubborn. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do, typical teenager. And I wouldn't go with her and she ended up leaving and had a super strong urge to turn around the car and come get me, but she just knew it wasn't worth it because I wasn't gonna go. I ended up going to work, I think I got off work at five and my two best friends at the time they wanted to hang out and my mom had specifically told me not to go anywhere that night because my dad was at home sick and she was like, you just need to like hang out with him, take care of him. And I was like, I'll just keep an eye on him, whatever, it'll be fine. And so me and my friend were like, let's go get some food and hang out in town for a while. So we go get food and in Burley and we ended up driving back out to Declo where I live and we have a big mountain out there that has a big, big D on it for Declo. And you can go to the base of it and watch the best sunsets. Hmm. So we drove there and we were watching the sunset, just having a good time talking. And I was feeling better. They were making me laugh. And um, my friend in the back seat, his mom called him and said that he needed to start heading home. And it was only nine o'clock. We were like, why do you have to go home? This is so weird. And she, we, so we asked her if we could go over to their house and make some crepes. And she was like, yeah, sure, that's fine. But his car was at my house, and then we needed to go back in early to get ingredients and then to his house. So we were back on the way to my house, which is four miles from where we were parked, and it's pretty much a straight shot, and none of us were wearing our seatbelts. And I can't remember what exactly happened because my memory just didn't remember this part. Um, super well, but I just started bawling and I'm guessing it was over the whole situation because there's nothing else I probably would have been crying about in that moment. And um, I lost control of the vehicle and, and I started or I started to go off the road on the left side 
And little backstory too, our roads are pretty narrow and um, since there's a lot of fields all around us because it's a super small town, a lot of dirt on the roads can't see like super clearly and I've got tears in my eyes and so I felt the car start going off the left side so then I overcorrected too far and way too far and we ended up going I don't know how to explain it I think there was a little hill on the side of the road a little bump and the car caught air and my side of the vehicle the driver's side of the vehicle hit the right side of the power pole and it flipped us sideways and we started flipping and rolling And from there, I was the first one ejected, and I wasn't on the ground like you would think. I was actually left suspended 30 feet in the air in a power line by my broken femur. Oh, okay. Um, Yeah, having seen the videos, uh, and I I did a little bit of background on this story, and um, it's horrific what happened to you and the state you ended up in. Let's first, before we get into that a little bit more, what happened to your friends? So then my passenger, she was the second one out, and she initially, I think, was knocked out, um, which makes sense. And eventually when she woke up, she was crying. She just, you can hear her in the back of the 911 call. A lot of people thought that was me. It wasn't. It was her. And she was just crying because... Obviously, we just got in a horrific car accident. Yeah. And she had a broken neck, back, and pelvis. And then he, uh, the front of the back seat, he was the third one out. And he was awake the whole time. And he was just facing me. And so he just had to walk. But I was faced the opposite direction, hanging. So I couldn't see them. They're behind me. But then he could see me. And he was bleeding out of his wrist because I think the main artery in his hand or wrist got cut or some vein in there. So he was bleeding out there and he had a broken mm, neck and pelvis, I believe. Hmm. Um, Who who called 911? So then we crashed in front of these people's house right there and their lights flickered obviously because I just landed in the power line and they were like that's weird and they had a friend over and he was about to leave anyways so he came out and saw the car in the field and I was calling for help because I was in the power line for an hour and because they couldn't get to me and I was the one calling for help they heard me and they came out and there was a few of them. I know the dad and a daughter came to help me, and they were just standing underneath me like, we don't know what to do. Felt so helpless because there's not much you can do in that situation. And the one daughter actually dropped to her knees and prayed, started praying because she felt like that's all she could do. And the dad, her dad, he told my dad he hadn't prayed in over 20 years, I think, and he prayed that night because he felt like that's all he could do. And then. Uh, the other people went to help my two friends and get them taken care of, taken care of, and mm-hmm. um, and then one of them called nine one one. I'm pretty sure, pretty quick. Okay. I don't know who the guy is on the call. Yeah. So I had never seen anything like this before. Um, you know, on YouTube or anywhere, where the uh, person in a uh, was ejected from the car ends up hanging on a power line. Um, mm-hmm. by their broken limb. So it was your leg, your femur area that mm-hmm. was sort of doubled over the power line. Is that right? Yeah. So in the picture, it can be kind of hard to yeah. understand what you're saying if you don't know what you're looking for. So um, I'm facing towards the road that the guy's standing on. So kind of towards the camera, but he's obviously sure. not standing in right in front of me. And then my leg is broken let me think so my leg is broken on my thigh my high thigh and so that's what's hanging over the power line and then my knee is then bent like this so it looks like a kind of a rectangle like a square Uh point if you see the picture you'd understand what i'm saying it's, it's the wildest thing and and that whole time you were conscious yeah i was conscious the whole time 
Were you in a lot of pain? So, I wouldn't say I was in pain. It was uncomfortable, and I was confused. I, I remember, like, all my thoughts when I was up there during it, and I could take you through that if you want. But, Please. I'm curious. Um, so, when I initially woke up, it was immediately no one was... Because I don't remember the process of being flung out, um, but I woke up pretty quick, and I remember being super high, upside down. It was dark, even though it wasn't necessarily super dark because it was just past nine. And um, I remember drowning in my blood, like, and I was just wiping it out because I was bleeding out of my injured arm. My leg is obviously torn, and so it's just all running down my body into my nose. And I remember I started to cry, and I've never been a big crier. I don't know why, but I I don't feel this way about other people, but for me, I feel weak, and it's just something I have always struggled with letting go of. And so I knew if I were to cry that I was done for, hmm. and that probably sounds so silly, but... No. Um, so I pulled it together, and I also felt just very uncomfortable, not necessarily in pain, and I was just confused. And then, like, why am I hanging up here? Like, what yeah, is going yeah, on? Yeah, I didn't even really realize I was in a power line. I just, like, and none of it really correlated sure. in my brain. And then, um, you were alone too, which is pretty scary. But yeah, because all my friends are behind right. me yeah. and I can't, I don't even remember hearing them. I don't remember much. Um, and then, some, yeah, I was awake the whole time. My memory is just a little patchy. Sure. Um, and then I got a FaceTime call from God, which I don't know if you've ever, if you've heard anything of when. Yeah, I haven't. Actually. When you've watched my story, I've explained this a few times, yeah. but I was up there and in my mind, I obviously didn't have my phone and it was a picture. It's actually this picture on my wall uh -huh. and it's a picture of Christ putting his hand through the water. And that was his profile picture and it was the accept and the decline button and God was calling me. And I knew it was him calling me home, and um, I started hitting the accept button, and it wasn't accepting, and I start panicking because the phone only rings for so long. Right. And eventually it just stops ringing, and I can see my reflection in the screen, and it's just beat up. Like, I'm bruised. There's blood everywhere. I looked rough, and I just knew in that moment I had to stay. I didn't know why yet, and I knew it was not going to be good because of what I saw in the reflection. And again, I just wanted to cry because I was confused. Why would God call me home and then not accept me? <laughs> I don't know. How do you look at it now, that, that little part of the story, like where God is FaceTiming you and you're trying to accept it and, and it's not going through? How do you interpret it now? I interpret it as he was just letting me know, know that I was there, he was there and that I wasn't alone up there huh. wow. and that um, he was keeping me here for a reason and that it wasn't just for like to go through yeah. pain. It was for a reason. So huh. what was it like in the aftermath of the whole ordeal? I mean, they finally get you down after an hour. Was it firemen that came? I don't remember that part. Yeah. So then there's my memory then flips to another time and there was a gr whole bunch of people underneath me. Cause when you live in a small town, not much happens and people are really nosy. Oh, I'm from and exactly the same size town. So yeah. I know when there's sirens in town, everybody chases. <laughs> and it <laughs> makes like... me like irked because I, especially after experiencing it, and I remember being up there and there's just a group of people underneath me and it felt like so many people. And I was like, you're all watching me, but no one's going to help me. And again, I'm still very not in it. I'm confused on what's happening. And they even were saying I was referring to people as ma'am and sir, which is not a thing really where I'm from. No one does that. So that was really? super odd. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I just kept asking like, hey, can you please get me down? <laughs> <laughs> and all of them are just like they're just standing there <laughs> they're just standing there and there's actually one lady she thought i was her granddaughter so she filmed she filmed me up there of them getting me off i've never posted it 
because it is gruesome. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, and then my memory flips up to where the one of the guys, either EMT firefighter, um, came to get me, and he was getting closer to me, and I was like, "You have to get me down," because at this point, it's been an hour. Like I'm exhausted. I'm bleeding. It's just horrific. Not not a good time. And um, I just looked him in the face and I said, you need to get me down. And he goes, we're trying everything we can. And he's like trying to stay calm and he's doing his best. But I could definitely tell he was panicked. And I just kind of stood there. Or not stood there. I was hanging there. <laughs> hanging um, out. Just hanging out there. <laughs> and... Um, he ended up putting the tourniquet on, and they said that's the only time I screamed and cried was when they put the tourniquet on. Because they put those things on tight. Yeah. Like, I don't remember necessarily crying, but I remember, like, the pressure of it right. was horrendous. And then my memory, again, kind of blacks out until I fall onto the stretcher. And it was like, in the video, my body is lifeless. Because my arm also has a severe injury where it was torn off in the accident and just hanging on by the skin on my back. Mm. So my body looks lifeless falling onto the stretcher. Yeah. And I remember just feeling like a relief of, oh, I don't have to fight anymore. It's not my job. They get me down to the ground and um, by the time I got down, I kind of had a feeling of peace, mm. like, it's okay. Like you don't have to fight anymore. Like I said, like um, you were, like it was over. Like you, you thought you were. Yeah, dying. like I genuinely thought. Like I had so much peace that I was going, and I wasn't scared at all, which is mm. weird. Um, because earlier I just wanted to go, and then at this point I was. I think it was just because I was so exhausted, and it was already so hard. Right. And I woke up in the ambulance again, and I was like, I don't know why I'm still here. I thought I was done. <laughs> And they're working on me. And it's like literally straight out of a movie where they're like, we're losing her because they didn't think I would even make it the life flight to Declo to Pocatello, which is only an hour drive. So I don't know what that would be with a helicopter. But um, and I remember looking at it, all of the people in there with I say with like gratitude in my eyes because I couldn't speak at that point because I think they'd had. Sure. already an intubator in my throat or something. oxygen or something sure. and i remember giving them the eyes of like okay like thanks for trying to save my life but i'm done and i don't remember anything until i woke up at the hospital like days later i think yeah. wow yeah um when you woke up uh i'm assuming someone had told your mom and dad were they were they there so, like I said, my mom had went to Logan, and so she was two hours away, and then my dad was at home, and we have Life360 on our phones um, all through high school I did, and so that's how we know how fast I was going. I was going three miles an hour over the speed limit, so nothing compared to what it could have been, yeah. and um, it didn't detect that I crashed, which it's supposed to. And it, my friend also, her phone didn't detect that we crashed either, which is so weird. But if you think about it, it was a blessing because my dad then didn't know the accident had happened. And um, he tra- my grandpa, I think, was on it at the time and he was tracking me. It was like his favorite activity to do for some reason. <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he noticed that my location had been in a ditch. Like, my phone was just in the field. And he was like, that's so weird. And he could see, since it was, because the, the accident ended up happening exactly a mile from my house. Yeah. So he heard all the sirens, the, could see the lights, everything. So he's like, this is so weird. Her location is exactly where that crash is. He calls my dad up and his go, goes, can you call Kennedy? I think something's wrong. So my dad calls me a few times and my dad starts panicking because I was always a kid in high school. My parents called me, I'm answering because right. it was always better that way. And so my dad <laughs> starts panicking because he's like, she never doesn't answer her phone. Yeah. And so he gets in the car, drives there. And at this point he'd gotten there. There was a police officer, 
police officer or something. I think that's who it was. And he, my dad's panicking frantically, like looking for me through all the crowds of people. And the police officer's like, you can't go any further. And he was like, he was like, that's my, I think that's my daughter. Like, he was like, Saying there's no words, way you're probably. stopping me right now. <laughs> yeah. And he sees the car in the field and starts booking running to it. And a guy from our church had called him over and was like, Jared, she's in here. And at this point, I had just gotten in the ambulance, which is a blessing, like yeah. I said, because if he were to see me hanging in a power line, I don't understand how you would cope with that as a father, feeling so helpless. Yeah. And so I'm so grateful he got there after they got me down. Um, Especially given and, that he was already sick and struggling. Yeah, and so he just dropped to his knees um, outside of the ambulance because they wouldn't let him in yet. And he just started praying, and he was like, please, God, I don't care. And it, th again, this sounds a little silly, but he was like, As, if you just keep her head, I don't care. Like, that's not logical, obviously, but he just wanted God to know that he would take me in any form mm. just to have his daughter and so he's like please 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 don't take her don't take her and um not even that's enough to make you cry kennedy because i'm about to sob like a baby <laughs> <laughs> as a father yeah, yeah it makes if i think about it too much um <laughs> wow so then they eventually let him come in and they said do you want to give her a blessing and he said yes i would love to gives me a blessing he goes i don't even know what i said in that blessing um, I just remember kissing you on the forehead and they told they told me that they were going to life flight you to Portneuf Hospital in Pocatello and that I probably wasn't going to make it so say your goodbyes and so that's what happened and he ended up getting out and him and my, my grandpa threw him in the truck and they they were like we don't know how, how fast we were going to to get there um but he said the whole way he like because he just kissed me on the forehead he's like sounds gross but he could taste my blood the entire way because it was just like just from giving me a kiss on the forehead that's how much blood there was yeah. um so yeah wow. he was there at least for a little bit of it not necessarily the aspect of hanging there but yeah yeah who was that little friend who i just saw on the screen <laughs> It's my roommate's orange cat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is uh is she is she camera shy or or what? Cuz I don't know. It seemed like she was into it until she realized there was a camera. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Um man. So I can't imagine it from your dad's perspective either. I mean, I'm a father of a teenager. Uh, she'll be in junior year next year and it's just all too much to even imagine. But let's talk a little bit yeah. about what happened next. You you survived the life flight. Obviously, you arrived at the mm -hmm. hospital. What kind of medical like marathon was in front of you? What did you have to go through? Um, so they life flighted me to Portno Saturday night, and they were a trauma two level hospital, I think it was. And they did the best they could with stabilizing me because um, I was in rough condition and they were like there's nothing else we don't know what to do with her like she's far beyond what we know how to do and so they were like in the morning we'll fly her to salt lake city um what were the University worst issues what what were the worst issues that you were facing the worst injuries so my worst injuries was obviously my leg was mang mangled beyond um and then my arm had severe nerve damage. Uh, I have a broken, I had a broken collarbone. I had a broken humerus. And then I have a brachial plexus injury, which was the nerve. And obviously my arm was torn off, so they had to re-put that back on. Um, so they ended up flying me to the University of Utah that Sunday, which was a trauma one level hospital. And they were even like, we don't see these wounds only in war. Like yeah. these aren't normal wounds you see. And um, I had a total of 21 surgeries on my arm and leg combined because my right side was untouched. I had no damage. Like, it was crazy. Weird. Even my ear was, like, tugged off. Not, like, hanging off, but, like, from here Detached. was pulled 
like just crazy little injuries all across my left side and then my right side doesn't have it barely has any scars from the accident like i have a little scar on my hand right here yeah. and right oh whoops you can't see right here and right here and then they took a vein out of my thigh wow and um so my right side was pretty much untouched yeah so what did they have to do for the leg so they told my mom that they could save it, which she did not believe because she ended up seeing it in the flight from Portnuff to the University of Utah. The cover came off my leg and she saw it and was like, you're lying if you think you can save that because it was, it was, it was bad. I have a picture of kind of what it looked like in my phone. I've also never posted it because it is gruesome. Um, and so they told him they could save my leg, and it obviously didn't end up happening. And they ended up having to amputate it through my knee. So halfway through my knee, they took it, and my break is clear up in my upper thigh. Uh huh. And um. They tried so, the knee because it's easier to recover. Yeah, if right. you have more leg, it's easier to walk with a prosthetic right. leg. And so they told him that, okay, we're going to take it here and see how the leg does. And my leg, um, so the, I was going in surgery every other day, I every, every, every day or every other day to see if the leg was doing okay. And every time it was rotting. Mm. So they would just, and it was literally, my dad says it was like a meat slicer. They just kept just cutting it off. I ended up having a total of five amputations and, um... They Every time just you came it. out of surgery, they you came out with less leg. Yeah, and I, I didn't even know I'd lost my leg at this point. And um, they ended up just having to take it out my leg because there was... I did end up finding out through one of those amputations before because uh, they told me that we went in for surgery. It was the before my last amputation I'd found out. And they told me I'd lost my leg. And they told me that I'd lost my leg at this point. Obviously, I didn't react as bad as I thought I would. Um, I just asked if my other two friends had to lose any limbs. And they said no. And I said, well, I'm glad I'm the one that had to lose it because I was driving. Mm. And at that point, I just kind of wanted to be left alone. But before my last amputation, one of the ones... They told me, your leg's doing great. We might, we're going to be able to wrap it up tomorrow, get everything put away, done with it. Like, no more amputations. If your leg is doing good tomorrow and it was doing good that day. So we were all praying and feeling really good about it. My dad had a lot of hope. And they said, but if we do have to take more leg, she will never be able to walk again. Because they thought my leg was too short. And so obviously this is like a massive thing. And by that night... um. My parents had left to go get food or something, and they brought in my grandpa and, like, my second mom. And they were just chatting up in there. And at this point, I can't speak very loud because I had my int um, intubation tube out, just not super long. Yeah. And uh, I felt like my body overheating, and I've had heat regulation issues since. Like, I run crazy hot. It's got a lot better, but... I don't know what the trauma did, but it was weird. And I noticed my temperatures getting so high that I literally felt like I was dying. And again, another experience with God I had is I was this little character on this beach running around doing these tasks. And it was, all came to me as a dream. Like, it was so weird, but I was felt like I was dying. And I was this little character doing all these tasks on this beach, running around like crazy. And I started levitating up this cliff. There was a massive cliff. And at the top of it was God reaching his hand down to get me, like um, grab my hand to pull me up. And I start panicking. I was like, no, 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 I have so much to do. I, it's not my time yet. And um, I just slowly started going up the cliff. And then I was pretty close. And the nurses all came in and they figured out how to get my temperature down and the time being, and it turned out my leg had rotted even more, and that's why I was doing that. Because if you have that big of an infection in your body, it will, it, like, it can kill you. Sure. And so it wasn't just in my head, which I kind of thought it was, 
Um, so then the next day they had to end up going and, and amputating my leg at the break. Mm-hmm. And um, that was the hardest day for my dad because he'd sat next to my bed and promised me, you're going to play soccer again, you're going to mm-hmm. run again, you're going to do all these things again. And then for him to feel like he lied to me absolutely destroyed him. <laughs> I bet. And have to face you and tell you the truth and see your reaction as had to have been a pretty hellacious moment for him. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, do you remember the first time you talked to your friends who were in the car with you after the accident? Um, I couldn't see them for a little bit, but I remember sending them a voicemail and I think I have at least one of their voicemails on my phone and I am just bawling. I just apologize over and over, um, again, because of what I did and I, didn't mean to obviously I would never put someone in a situation like that ever and I felt so bad about everything and um I remember the girl I'm pretty sure we talked on the phone and I we just cried on the phone together because she was like it's okay I don't blame you like I don't hold this against you at all you're still my best friend and we it was pretty much just a cry fest which Mm. makes sense but (laughs) yeah yeah I don't know and, and the guy? I'm pretty sure I left him the voicemail, but then we ended up did talking on the phone and it was kind of the same thing yeah. of just crying and apologizing and him just saying, it's okay. Wow. I had, like, they were very gracious with me. What a blessing, yeah. That could have gone all different kinds of ways. Yeah, and we actually all ended up staying friends. Um, me and him have been friends continuously through this whole thing. Um, stayed close and then... Me and her, we had a falling out, not because of the accident or anything with that. It was just, sure, it we grew apart a little bit um, for a while. And then we actually started reconnecting again recently. So it's been good. The huh. last, the last probably six months, I want to say. How cool. That's yeah. good. Do you still feel guilt ridden? Yeah, I think I always will. Really? Yeah. And I know they are fully back to normal from what I know no pain um but still they had to go through such a traumatizing experience that gave them trauma PTSD pain all of those things that it still will make me feel bad and I don't know I guess how to get rid of it what do you do with it stuff it down somewhere and just <laughs> survive stuff it deep down yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I I try to, I've used TikTok as my (laughs) therapist, which I didn't realize um, how brutal TikTok is Mm -hmm. because I, so I took over, my sister started an Instagram, Instagram account for me two days into the accident, just giving the community updates because we couldn't text everyone, they couldn't text everyone back. And I ended up taking over the Instagram when I got out of the hospital. And then I decided I was going to start a TikTok page. And I used it as like awareness, kind of get my feelings out there with humor, all of the things. And TikTok is brutal. Like they leave nasty comments. If they oh. feel a certain way, they're going to tell you. And I didn't realize that because I'd never been someone that commented nasty things on videos or I, I guess... And TikTok was fair, not new, new, but I think it came out during COVID. Yeah, that's when it really blew up. Yeah, Yeah. so I guess I didn't look at comments very much. And yeah, people people went after how I physically looked because I was now disabled is the word. I don't love that word, but... um, Yeah. Yeah, so that... That was an adjustment for sure. My impression of TikTok is like that's where you are protected from things like that, maybe as opposed to I don't know. Twitter seems more vile to me in some ways, but <laughs> I've never been on Twitter, so I've I never don't been know on that. TikTok. So I'm just going based on <laughs> impression. But I thought that <laughs> you know you don't criticize um, disabled or differently abled people. Um, yeah, and they thought I was lying about the whole situation. They thought I made everything up, even though I had picture proof. Man brutal world yeah it, w- it was rough when i first blew up yeah 
So let's talk about um, in the aftermath of the last amputation. I mean, you had to get acquainted with your, you know, new um, limb or lack thereof and, and uh, come to terms with everything. And I guess there was some physical therapy involved. And what was all that like? So when I found, so obviously my dad had told me I lost my leg, but I didn't know how much of it I'd lost or what was really left. It was a whole new world. And the physical therapy came in the next day after I got my amputation. And they were like, okay, let's do 10 squats. And my dad about had a cow. He was like, what do you think you're doing? Like, she just got out of surgery yesterday. And they were like, she can do it. And I was like, yeah, I can do it. I'm fine. And they sat me up. And at this point, I could barely, like, it was a struggle to even sit up at a 90 degree angle sure. for 15 minutes. Like, it was crazy. And, but I still did it, and obviously they weren't like deep squats, they were just like, <laughs> not even really squats, but that's besides <laughs> the point. Yeah, um, it's still amazing. Yeah, and um, so they came in, we did the 10 squats, and when they sat me up, I'd ask them like, is my gown covering my leg? And they said, yes, it's covering your leg, you're good. So then I did my 10 squats, and I sat down and I was feeling really good, making jokes, whatever. And I accidentally looked down, not realizing my leg was not covered anymore. And I saw how short it was. And I really do have a super short amputation. Um, and I just remember looking up at my dad and I was like, just started crying. I said, you never told me it was this short. What, what am I going to do with this? There's nothing here. And he just looked at me like, I'm sorry. Like, even though he couldn't control it, he didn't know what to say. And I probably should have given him some grace, but I didn't know. I was 16. Yeah, I and you were in shock. Yeah, and um, it was hard. It was really hard. I cried for a little bit, hmm. and then they told me I should touch it. And it was still wrapped, so it's not like a bare leg, because yeah. that would freak me out, because I have scars all over it because of the power line. Sure. And they told me to touch it, and I was like, you're freaking crazy if you think I'm going to touch that thing. <laughs> like, there's no way. And they were like, okay, it weirded you out or you were yeah, angry? Yeah, it okay. weirded me out. Yeah, yeah. And um, they were like, okay, just take your time. Within, I think, five minutes, I was touching it. And I was like, okay, it's not too bad. Yeah. Uh, then they laid me down and they told me to get on my side to move it, like, move it around so it doesn't get stiff. And I was like, okay, so I was doing it. And um, I just started, I used to, in high school, there was, I can't even remember how it started, but it would, they would, I don't know how to explain it. Hmm. But there was like this song and uh, I ended up naming my leg Gobi because my trauma name in the hospital was Trauma Gobi hmm. because I was a minor and they can't disclose my name. And so I named my nub Gobi and I would just, <laughs> I was like moving it around and I was like, go Gobi, go Gobi. And I have like a video of it and my voice is like super raspy and yeah. I look like garbage, but. Uh, I remember people, that moment. I've seen that. And what yeah, stood out to and, me was just your ability to conjure up a sense of humor in a moment like that. Mm -hmm. And the nurses were like, we've never seen anything like this. Like most people are angry, sad. They don't, it takes them months to even like touch it or do anything with it. And I was like, huh, like, I don't know, I guess it was foreign to me and I, I can't even say it was me that gave yeah. me that ability. It was a hundred percent God. Yeah. You were in the hospital for seven weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so that took up a big part of that summer there between junior and senior yeah. year. I, I'm yeah. guessing they let you pass junior year and um, yeah. moved on. I got out of all my finals. It was great. <laughs> well, there's a silver <laughs> lining. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so what was senior year like when you go back to school? So I got, I was in a wheelchair because in the hospital too, my leg was healing up. And the nurse, I'd snuck out of bed one day because I was on FaceTime with my two friends in the accident. And I had something across the room I needed, but in the hospital, in rehab, you're not supposed to get out of bed because obviously you're a huge liability if you fall. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm fine. And I got out of bed, got in my wheelchair, went and grabbed the thing, got back in my bed, and I'm like looking around, and I'd never seen my leg bare. 
and the wrapping of my leg is stuck to the side of my bed. And I was like, oh no. And my, I was like, my leg is bare right now. So I called the nurse in and she actually came in and ace wrapped my leg. But you're not supposed to do that to uh, a wound that still has stitches in it. Uh-huh. Because she tied it so, uh, wrapped it so tight that it busted a hole in the end of my leg. And so I have a huge scar at the end of my leg. And it took months and months to freaking get this hole to heal. Wow. And so I went into my senior year in a wheelchair when I think I could have probably been walking. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was hard because people are looking at you weird, trying to figure you out because they haven't seen you in person yet. Yeah. They just want to, yeah. like, look at you but not know, not let you know that they're looking at you. Right. Um, but luckily I had a lot of really good um, friends, guy friends that opened the doors for me, pushed me around if I needed literally anything they would do for me. Um, and it made the process a lot easier. And then in September, I think I got my first prosthetic leg. So I got a leg even really quick for having my oh, leg yeah. busted open. And um, when I got my leg, I was walking without a crutch in less than a week. Goodness gracious. Because I was like, I'm, I, I was very like, this is my goals and this is what I want. Sure. And I've met people that have pros- prosthetic legs that they've been on a crutch for two years. And they're young. They were like my age because they just aren't, they're afraid, which makes sense. I totally understand that. But... Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I just well, never wanted to be that way. Probably. Yeah. Probably mostly your sort of psychological makeup and your toughness, your small town grit, your, um, <laughs> athleticism playing soccer probably helped. Um, yeah. and, but what's more amazing is how high up the, the prosthetic had to go. And usually that, mm-hmm. um, makes for a longer period of learning to walk, right? Like if yeah. it's a, if yeah. it's a, at the knee or below the knee, you're obviously going to have a quicker turnaround time usually than, something yeah. like your situation. Yeah, especially without a knee. Below the knees and above the knees are very, very different. Yeah. Um, you don't realize how much a knee actually is a big deal. Yeah. Because prosthetic legs are good. The one I have is really good. Like, I don't fall anymore. The one I first got, I fell all the time. And it was a huge liability for my arm because it was still, still healing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How's the arm healed up, by the way? We've talked a lot about the leg, but how's the arm doing? Um, it's the best that it can be. Um, I have a severe um, nerve damage, so it doesn't work a lot. It works... Um, I don't know how to explain it. It works enough that I can use it for smaller tasks, Sure. but I don't have any triceps. Okay. Um, it only really goes up to my mouth kind of, but that again, takes a lot of work, sure. goes out a little bit. I can move it here and there. Yeah. Were you right handed before the accident? Yeah. Oh, that's good. So that's, that's convenient. Yeah. So, um, what's the, uh, what's life like now? I mean, you're out of high school mm-hmm. and you're in, um, you're, you're taking classes, um, in, in tech school and, um, learning business technologies. Is that what you're is that right? Mm-hmm. Did I get that right? Yeah. Um, so I guess how has life changed? What's different? What's the same? Like, what's it like um, to be you now? Life isn't, I mean, it's definitely hard, but um, I've tried to look at the like most positive aspect of it. Of I'm still here. God gave me this opportunity. I'm going to use it and use my platform to inspire others. And Are you dealing with chronic pain? I do have chronic pain Um, since I have so much nerve damage, which is weird, um, but I have a lot of nerve pain in my two fingers right here, my pointer and my thumb. It's constant. It never goes away, but Mm. sometimes it gets heightened and it's awful. And then when I get sick, it gets really, really bad. And then where the nerves got pulled out of my spine is always super sensitive, but it's not chronic pain. It's just if you touch it. So that's pretty much the chronic pain that I live in. How do you manage it? I take Lyrica, which is a nerve medicine. Other than that, you just live with it. Yeah. I would imagine. Which it can get mentally wearing. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that. 
Yeah, but it's whatever. We're good. <laughs> You're so strong. It's crazy. It's whatever. I'm good. Let's keep going. <laughs> you really don't want to be anybody's victim, do you? No, I find it, which this could sound bad, but since I'm in a rough situation myself, I feel like I can say it. People that sit there and complain about their lives and how hard it is and everything that's hard in their lives over and over and over that just want sympathy and it personally drives me nuts because you do feel bad at first, but once they milk it over and over and over, it's just like, okay, now this is like getting tiring and I've never wanted to be that person because it's hard, but keep it to yourself unless you need help. Um then seek help and have, you can have people. And I do have my hard days where like, I do break down and need to talk about it. Yeah. But I I'm not constantly like, oh, life is so hard, feel bad for me because I've still made life good. I've learned how to ski, snowboard, mountain bike, all of the things. Wait, like, really? Life is, yeah, I skied six months post accident with a broken arm still. <laughs> like snow skiing? Uh, yeah, that was actually snowboarding. <laughs> Come yeah <laughs> you're a hero that's amazing yeah so i don't know i just feel like you can be in a tough situation but that doesn't mean like my issues i still had with the accident before i don't have an eating disorder anymore but does it do i still struggle with the thought of like having those thoughts of like oh don't eat that you don't need that yeah but that doesn't mean it has to consume my whole life like it did before i don't struggle with depression. Do I have hard days? Yeah, I do because chronic pain. Yeah. Life is hard sometimes. Does my dad still have cancer? Yes. Is there anything I can do about it? No. Like mm. you just have to look at the better things of life or you will just sit and focus on everything that's wrong with your life because there's a lot of it, mm -hmm. but there's also a lot of good. Mm. But sometimes it can be easier to look at the bad. Sure. It's interesting to me, you said you don't struggle with depression anymore. Anybody, any objective observer would look at your life and go, well, it's probably more depressing now than before. Yeah, before I look at myself. before you were depressed and now you're not, what do you chalk that up to? God. Really? And yeah. I genuinely, people ask, like, why are you okay now when you weren't before? And I have no answer other than God. I really, I think he gave me, I think he gave me the kick in the butt to be like, okay, I'm giving you a boost of good mental health. And that sounds probably dumb, but I think he gave me, like, blessed me with good mental health, but I had to upkeep it. Like, he wasn't going to keep me going, and it wasn't going to keep running on him. So I think now it's running on me, and I've just kept my mental health good by sharing my story on social media and being um, the inspiration to others and sharing my story with groups of people that I speak to, um, proving to myself and others that I can do things because a lot of people don't think I can do things. One thing about my dad that drives me nuts <laughs> is he knows that if he tells me you can't do that, oh, I will do it. Uh -huh. Like rock climbing. Um, he told me there was a rock climbing clinic and I was like, I'm going to go. And he was like, a one-legged one-armed girl cannot rock climb. <laughs> and I was so I was so angry. I was like, <sighs> I got my harness on. I climbed the wall. I was like, wow. you're wrong. <laughs> Did you video and, for him or something so he could see it? So he could rub it in his face a little? <laughs> yeah, I was, I don't know. And so stuff like that just makes me feel good to prove to myself that I can still do things. It's just going to look a little different and might yeah. take a little longer, but that's okay. We're almost um, at the end of our time, but could you just say a little bit more about what that relationship with God looks like now? Like, I, it's, I hear you say it's God that's brought you out of the, you know, the, the darkness from the past, but what does that relationship actually look like for you? Um, I'm probably not the best at upkeeping it as I should be. Like I'm not, I don't pray every day like I'm supposed to, but I do, I feel him a lot more than I ever did. And I feel very connected with him even. And it's not that I don't like, It's I guess it's not that I don't sit there and pray on my knees every day, but I talk to him daily and like my thoughts and sometimes out loud. And But when I do pray to him, I go to him when I'm at my lowest and I will pray for 
not even kidding you, 40 minutes of just crying to him about, like, how grateful I am or what I'm struggling with and what I need more help with. And um, he's never made me feel alone, ever. And, like, since the accident. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how to explain that's it, awesome. I guess. That's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. I was, it's a very personal question, so yeah, I appreciate your, your honesty there. Um, what's your vision now for the future? What do you hope your life looks like um, five, ten years from now? Um, I want to be a public speaker where I'm traveling all over the world. That would be so cool, sharing my story. Um, keep doing social media, sharing that, and keeping... Um, that up as a job and obviously married and have kids obviously kids, so is kids there... are a little scary for me because of my situation now sure. i'm very intimidated yeah. but it is something that i do want so yeah is there a young man in your life at this point there is <laughs> i knew there was i just wanted to hear you say it. <laughs> <laughs> i've there seen is. your social media yeah yep. tell me a little bit about him before we wrap up um, we've been together for over a year and he's probably the biggest reason I feel okay with what I physically look like now because in the hospital I used to cry over the fact that I thought no one was ever going to love me because of what I physically looked like and I truly believed it and it's not even that he just shows me or tells me that he doesn't like he loves the way that I am and he wouldn't change it it's that he truly acts like it you would and he cares for me and will do anything to make my life easier and we're really happy yeah it's been it's been great he's helped me a lot when it comes to um how I feel about myself physically yeah and that is what I need social media lies about young women in a lot of ways but it also lies about young men being these sort of, you know, sex hungry, sex hungry monsters and whatever and social yeah. media says men are. And there's some good dudes out there. It sounds like you found No, them. I agree. And I guess I never thought I could ever get someone as at all. But then like someone like him, because there are a lot of guys where it's like, mm, your intentions are not where yeah. I'm wanting. And um, he has very good intentions. And yeah. He's proved that to me and my family. And What's his first name? Alec. All right. Has Alec put a ring on it yet? No. <laughs> no. All right, Alec, if Not you're listening, yet. buddy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm playing the dad role. Does your dad approve of Alec, by the way? <laughs> Does my dad? Yeah. Yes. Good. Yeah, which is surprising. He doesn't give anyone a chance. Right. Nope. No one's good enough. Sounds like a good dad. Does your grandfather still stalk you on your uh, the app? <laughs> He's not on there anymore. <laughs> okay. But, yeah. yeah, I've got a good dad. Yeah. i got a good family, good support Sounds system. Sounds like it. Sounds like mm -hmm. it. Your dad's yeah. cancer, has that, uh, has that outlook changed? How, how is that looking? Um, uh, yeah, um, it's come back a little more aggressive. And it's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so it's not curable. He'll like he'll never Manager. go into remission. Mm -hmm. um, so they're trying to figure out. They'll see. We'll check back in a few months to see how's everything going and what the next steps will be if it needs to be chemo or what. So okay, we'll be yeah. we'll be holding him and your family in prayer. I know Thank that's you. That a hard a road. And um, hope all of our listeners will uh, follow you on social media. What's your What's your handle? It's underscore kick it Kenny underscore nine. You can also just search Kennedy Little Dyke, and it should come up. TikTok Powerline Girl, that works. <laughs> TikTok Powerline Girl, <laughs> there it is. Uh, well, Kennedy, I've never heard a story like yours. Um, I want everybody to hear your story and, and stick with you um, through it as it's just starting to unfold. I think you're just now mm -hmm. really starting to understand why exactly you went through everything you went through and why you're still here. And yeah, uh, I, I can't wait to see what unfolds in your life and how God uses you as you really start to understand uh, your purpose after the, yeah. uh, the accident. So 
thank God for yeah, you and for so. your story and your courage. And I just pray you'll keep going. I will. Thank you.